this is the Fujifilm X-T4. It's Fuji's latest flagship 26 megapixel APS-C camera and it's the first in the X-T line to have uh, image stabilization with five axis stabilization on the sensor. Now, I've been using the, uh, the X-T line for about four years since the X-T1 and with each iteration from the X-T1 to the X-T2 and the X-T3, with each generation, Fuji have introduced a, a new sensor and a new image processor. And this is the first time that Fuji haven't done that. So this has the same sensor and the same image processors on the previous cameras on the X-T3. So this upgrade is basically all about other features, things like the image stabilization, a different screen, bigger battery, things like that. And basically making the camera much a much more video uh, capable camera. So whether it's worth the upgrade if you're coming from the X-T3 or if you're coming from outside of the Fuji system and looking at either the X-T3 or the X-T4, that's really going to depend on what you're going to use the camera for. Now, I'll say right from the start that I'm a landscape photographer. It's what I do for a living. And the way that I look at a camera and the way that I judge a camera is always going to be from that point of view. I tend to do all of my shooting in manual exposure and focus. And I don't really look at things like autofocus speed or high speed shooting or things like that. Now, additionally, I'm not really a pixel peeper. I don't tend to zoom into all my images to see if I'm getting maximum resolution. I'm far more interested in what a camera can do for me in the field and, and how it can help me achieve the kind of creative results that, I, that I'm interested in, that I want when I'm shooting. Uh, that's really the reason why I stopped using full frame, why I switched from full frame to the Fuji system in the first place. So this review, like all my reviews, it's not going to be particularly scientific. It's not going to feature resolution shots. I'm just going to be looking at what this camera can do for me as a landscape photographer and also as someone who makes videos for a YouTube channel like this. So as I said at the beginning, it has the same 26.1 megapixel sensor as the X-T3 and the same X-Trans4 image processor. It's the same with video. It's got four, it shoots 4K at up to 60 frames per second. So in terms of the output from the camera, the photographs and the video, it's gonna look exactly the same as the X-T3. And because that camera is also very similar to the X-T2, it's not gonna be really that different from that in terms of what you get out of the camera. It's the other things, the other differences that you're gonna notice with the camera. And in terms of image quality, it's really not a bad thing because the image quality pretty much from the X-T2 all the way through up to this has, has been consistently excellent and I've never felt that I needed more. But I'll talk about the image quality a little bit later. So first let's have a look at the dimensions of the camera now. The reason that I switched to Fuji in the first place was because I wanted to use smaller, lighter bodies. And one of the things that put me off the X-H1, which was Fuji's other camera with image stabilization, was that it was a much bigger, heavier camera and felt much more like a DSLR. Now what Fuji have done with this is they've shrunk the image stabilization down to make a camera that's pretty much the same size as the X-T3. It's a little thicker in the body and it does have a deeper, body, deeper hand grip here because it has a bigger battery, but it's still not anything like the X-H1. It's, it feels very similar to the, um, to the X-T3 and I really can't notice that much of a difference. It is heavier at 600 grams, whereas the X-T3 was 539, but you can put that down to the Abyss and the bigger battery. Now, build quality feels the same as on all the previous X-T cameras, which I've been using for four years in all kinds of conditions. I've used them in really dusty conditions in Indonesia and in the, in the highlands and in Iceland, where there's lots of volcanic kind of dust. I've used them in really cold winter conditions at the top of mountains in the Dolomites, where it was down to minus 22, in frozen conditions in Iceland and in the north of Norway in Lofoten. And I've used them in really humid conditions in places like the Azores, here in Portugal, or shooting next to waterfalls, and they've never let me down. I've never really had a problem with the build quality of these cameras, and they've always felt tough and solid and professionally built. And this basically feels the same, and I'm totally confident that it's gonna be fine in pretty much any environment that I'm gonna take it into shoot. Now, there are some changes in the layout of the cameras, so some of the function buttons on the top, and also the Q button on the back here, which has been moved slightly. Also, the sub-dial beneath the shutter dial, which used to have the different exposure modes, and now basically it's used for switching between film and movie mode, or still photography mode. And now, I really like this split. I think it's really useful. It also means that the menu is split as well, so when you're looking, when you've got the camera set up in video mode or in film mode, all of the menus are film orientated, including the My Menu, where you put the features that you use most commonly. 
And likewise, when you put it over into still photography mode, you get basically all of the things that you only need in still photography mode. So it keeps the menus a lot leaner. You spend a lot less time scrolling through. And also it means that I have a my menu for photography and a custom my menu just for video, which I, I just find it makes things a lot faster, a lot more intuitive. Additionally, you can have different exposures for the movie mode and the, and the photography mode using these wheels here. So if you've got it in T mode, you can use the wheel here at the back for shutter time and the wheel at the front for aperture. So for example, if you're shooting in photography mode, you can have maybe a half second shutter and you're shooting at, at F8 or whatever. And then when you shoot over to, you go over to video mode, you can give yourself totally different uh, settings, something like 30 frames per second, shooting at 130, 30 frames per second, and shooting wide open. But then when you go back to the photography mode, the settings that you're shooting in there remain. It doesn't carry the settings between the video and the photography mode. And the other big change here is the screen. Now on the X-T3, the screen was articulating both up and down and in portrait mode. But here you've got a fully flexible screen, which you can see you can turn it around completely so you don't get fingerprints or just have it like that. It flips around so you can use it from the front, which is really useful for, for if you're vlogging. I used this on a video that I made a, little, a few weeks ago. I found this really useful. Now I've switched back to the X-T3 to make this video and already I'm really missing using this. It's useful, it's useful for framing, it's useful for focus. You can use a touch focus, which means you can lean forward and start to touch focus and you can see all the shooting video, all the shooting details while you're using it. Also, it's completely articulating, so you can have it like that or you can articulate it up or you can articulate it down. So it's a much more useful screen in pretty much every way, but there's a caveat to that for landscape shooters because most landscape shooters like myself use an L bracket, which has a, has a bracket which extends around up the side of the camera so you can attach the camera to the tripod in portrait mode. Now, because of this articulating screen, the bracket is gonna to have to go up here, which means the screen won't be able to fold out or to cover the doors here. There's not really a solution that's gonna leave, leave access to both. Now, there are some things that are already on the market. There's a, a thing called the small rig, which has a, has a the side bracket can move forwards and backwards or in and out, but uh, it has a really ugly wooden grip on the side. It's not something that I wanna use. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there will be more third party solutions coming to the market soon because it's still a very new camera. But at the moment, it really is impossible to use an L bracket with this because you do need access to these doors. The top door here is where you plug the microphone, which is essential if you're using video. And then it's also got the remote if you're using a trigger remote. Now on the X-T3, one of the things that I liked is that Fuji finally moved the, uh, the, the remote control onto this side, which made it excellent for, for, um, for shooting with an L bracket. But for some reason, they've decided to put it back here behind this door on this camera. And also it's a 2.5 um, millimeter switch. So you're gonna need an adapter, which uh, also for if you're using headphones, I don't know if you can use an adapter for this. I don't know if you can use headphones there. Fuji state that you use the USB slot here for plugging in, uh, for using an adapter for headphones. That seems to me like a bit of a step back. I like the way that this door and these slots were laid out on the X-T3, but there you go. Okay, so the image stabilization. How good is it really, and is it actually any use? Now it's five axis stabilization on the sensor, and Fuji say that it will give you six and a half stops with most of their lenses, and five stops with the remaining lenses. Now. What does that actually mean in real terms? So if you're shooting with a telephoto lens at 100 millimeters, the general rule of thumb would be that you should always double, your shutter time should always be double your focal length. So if you're shooting at 100 millimeters, you would want one two hundredth of a second uh, focal length to avoid any camera shake. Now, five stops, five stops slower than that is something like one sixth of a second. I think I worked that out in my head, but yeah, about a sixth of a second, which is incredibly slow for a handheld shot. So this is the shot that I did handheld at one sixth of a second and 100 millimeters. So let's try another test here. So this is with the lens at 200 millimeters where any shake is gonna be magnified. And I'm gonna hold it with just one hand and I'm gonna hold it quite like this still for quite a while until my hand starts to shake with the pressure. And you can see now that my hand's shaking, but on the, on the screen with the image stabilization, you can see how effective that is. And just to give you a close-up of that, this is the image without stabilization, and this is the image with stabilization. And that, for me, is really, really impressive. 
So there's also an image stabilization boost mode, which to be honest, I didn't really notice much of a difference with. And then there's also digital stabilization, which is the same kind of software stabilization that you'll get in apps like Filmic Pro on an iPhone. But what that does is actually crops into the image to give you a 1.1 crop. Uh, because it's actually cropping into the sensor to make to give you additional stabilization on the image that you've already made. So overall, I've been really impressed with the image stabilization, particularly for making films, particularly with a wide angle lens. I find that when I, when I move with the camera, it feels almost as smooth as footage that I would film with the DJI Osmo gimbal. And that just makes it great for things like panning shots, for product shots. It's gonna be fantastic for anyone who's making vlogs as it eliminates a lot of the jerkiness of the footage and feels almost like a steady cam. Now in the X-H1, the, uh, the image stabilization came at quite a significant cost to battery life because the X-H1 used these same batteries as cameras like the X-T2 and the X-T3. Uh, and it really did chew a lot of the battery life down. Now those cameras were, I think, uh, registered at about 380, 390 shots per charge. Fuji have produced a much bigger battery for the, for the X-T4, this one, uh, which they're saying will give you 500 shots or 600 shots in a, a economy mode. Now economy mode apparently affects the autofocus and some of the LCD performance, not something that I've noticed particularly in the way that I shoot. And that is a big jump. Just from 390 shots to 500 shots is a 30% improvement. So 600 shots is quite a significant jump and kind of makes, it takes away the, um, the cost of, of, of image stabilization and makes me want to use it a lot more. Now, I've never really measured in the past exactly what, how many shots that I can get from a charger because my shooting is too varied. I can be doing things like long exposures. Sometimes I can be using the EVF. Sometimes I can be using the, LC, the LCD screen. Sometimes I'll be shooting 4K video. Sometimes I'll do a time lapse. So it's very hard for me to measure exactly how long the, the battery lasts on a camera. But usually I find that in an average shooting session, I'll get through like one and a half charges. So with this, I'm hoping that, that basically one battery is gonna get me all the way through a landscape shooting session, but I really won't know that until I've had more of a chance to travel with it and use it much more in the field. Now, while we're on the subject of the batteries, I will say that the X-T4 doesn't come with a battery charger anymore. Previous cameras have always had a battery charger that you plug in. Charging on this from the box is with, with USB-C, which uh, plugs into the side here now. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I don't like having to plug the whole camera into a wall, even though I know it doesn't really make much difference. And the plus side of that is that it is less stuff to carry with me. If I were taking this camera and the X-T3 with me on trips, I'd have to have two separate chargers, which is just more space, more stuff to carry. What I think I'm gonna do is just do all of the ch camera charging with the USB-C. It's not ideal, but it does mean that I have less stuff to shove in my bag. So what about the image quality? What kind of image quality can you expect from the X-T4? Now, as I said at the beginning, this isn't gonna be a scientific review. I don't really look at cameras in that way. I'm only really concerned about whether the image quality that I get from a camera is gonna be good enough for my professional use. And in that respect, the Fuji cameras always have been. What you can see behind me here, this is a one meter print uh, made from the X-T2. So I've never really had, I've never really felt that the Fuji cameras have let me down in any way. And because this has got the same sensor as the X-T3, I already know exactly what the images are gonna look like, which is good really, because due to the, uh, the lockdown that I'm under at the moment, I've had to cancel all of my trips and I haven't been able to really get out doing any shooting for landscape photography. So my test images for this have basically had to be some shots around Lisbon. But what I can also do is look at some of the shots that I've been shooting this year with the X-T3 in different conditions because the sensor and the image processor is exactly the same. So the image output is gonna be exactly the same on both cameras. Now, let's have a look at some images that I've shot with the X-T4. Now, for the purpose of analyzing images, I'm gonna be using Capture One Pro 20. I use Lightroom as well, I like both software, but I do find that Capture One has better, slightly better raw conversion and just pulls more detail out of the file. So I just feel for the purpose of analyzing what you can get from the camera, it's just better software to use. So this is an image that I shot with the um, with a 10 to 24 in my neighborhood. So let's just zoom in a little bit to 100% so we can have a lot of detail and just give it full screen there. And you can see the detail around the door handles in the center 
it pulls out a lot of detail. Now, I think uh, the problem with analyzing these kind of things is that you're always going to be like here, you can see. Now, this is nothing to do with the camera. This is just the performance of the lens in the borders. And then there's the compression to do with the YouTube and the video and things like that. So it's always very difficult to get an accurate idea of the exact kind of image quality that you can expect from a camera when you look at it in this way. So this also, it's shot with, it's shot with a 1024, so again, full screen. Now this is a tricky one because it's very backlit and you can see that the, um, the flowers here are slightly out of focus because of the depth of field. If we go to the next image, you can see here, this is where I, I change the focus. So here they're nice and sharp, uh, but the background is slightly out of focus. Uh, but here, the foliage, it just, this is at 100%, it has plenty of detail, it's really nice, the colour is really nice, the way that it deals with the highlights being very backlit, it's nice. I don't really see chromatic aberration, but again, that's more to do with the lens, it's not something that you would really worry about from the camera. This is shot at the end of my street. So again, let's just zoom into 100%. This is shot with the 55 to 200 telephoto. When you look around the center here, you can see the detail around these, these cables um, and down here in the, in the awning cover and, and in the shutters, there's just a lot of detail that the camera's pulling out. Now, as I said, I haven't had a lot of chance to use this camera and I haven't had an opportunity to take it with me on a trip, but I have been using the X-T3 for about 18 months. And because that has exactly the same sensor, I can look at some of the images that I shot with that camera out in the field just to give a better idea of, of how the images in the X-T4 are going to look like because they have exactly the same sensor, exactly the same image processor. So you're not going to see a difference. So let's just have a look at this one. This is shot in Iceland. Now we can zoom in here. Actually, I'll leave this. I won't go full screen because I want to have a look at some of the of the shadow and highlight recovery. So we can see here that when we press this, we've lost highlight detail here in this ice. This is taken beneath a glacier in Iceland. So let's just have a go at pulling that back with the highlights. And you can see when we we'll just zoom into a 300% how much detail it pulls back there. It's, it's very nice, has very good control of highlights. Likewise, if we look at the shadows in the top here, and we'll just pull those shadows out a little bit. Again, you can see that there's so much detail being recorded. The dynamic range of the camera is really nice. And again, just to look at the sharpness and detail that you get from the files, I find this perfectly fine. The detail here that you can see in the ice is absolutely wonderful and it's just great for my needs. We can look at a, at a shot here taken in the mountains again. Uh, let's just zoom into 100%. I think here we're losing some, we're clipping some highlights in the clouds there. So let's just, um, let's just pull that back. And again, you can see the dynamic range is lovely. We can get pretty much all of the detail back in Capture One. See if we can get all of that back there. Um, I've been really impressed in the, in the time that I've been using this sensor with the dynamic range that it's capable of with the detail as well. Again, this is with the 55 to 200 and the rock detail here is really nice. If we go down to the person, he's standing uh, quite a long way away. That's one of the workshop participants and um, the detail there, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Let's have another a look at another shot. This is from Norway. Um, again, it's saying clipped highlights there. Let's see if we can pull them back and that's fine. But I think a bigger problem here is with the shadows in the bottom here. So what would happen if we pull them out? And again, you can see here in the detail on these rocks, here the moss on the side, this seaweed all around here. This is a long exposure. It's about a 30 second exposure. You can see that the water is really blurred there. The detail in the villages, just let me turn that off so we can see. And the, the mountain face across the other side is really nice. I just find the, uh, the image quality that I get out of these cameras to be wonderful. Now let's just have a look at a high ISO image. This is shot at ISO 2500. Uh, it's an Aurora shot, um, 13 seconds, so there's going to be noise here for sure. Now this is straight out of the camera, I haven't done anything to it. But you can see that the noise, and you would expect noise at 13 seconds at either 2500, the noise is really manageable here and it's still recording plenty of detail. So this is a shot that just with a little playing around with the, with the white balance, let's just 
uh, we would make it a bit cooler and pull the greens out just a little bit like that. That tends to be what you do with Aurora shots. Let's get it. And I'm perfectly happy shooting Astro. I have been really happy shooting Astro, shooting Aurora with this with this lens. I think it's uh, really nice. There is always going to be noise at, at high ISO, but I mean, we're zooming in at 200% now. And that's the kind of noise that I can live with. Now, when it comes to the video quality, the X-T4 will shoot 4K video at up to 60 frames per second and 400 megabytes per second transfer for up to 20 minutes and full HD for up to 30 minutes, which is just the same as the X-T3 and you'll see no difference whatsoever to the output. However, you've also now got really slow motion at 240 frames per second in HD mode, which when you put that out at 24 frames per second is 10 times slow motion and half the speed of the 120 frames per second that was available on the X-T3. It also shoots F-Log, which is fantastic for color grading. It's basically raw form for video. Uh, it just allows you to, to color grade the, the footage better and ensure that you've got a consistent feel and look across, clip, across all of your clips and clips are shot with different cameras and for example, something like footage from a drone. Now the X-T4 has a huge range of, of video specifications and video and ways of outputting the video to the SD card and via HDMI, but I don't really use most of those different options when I'm shooting in the field. I only really care about what I can output onto the SD card. And you've also got access to Fuji's film simulations. Now, I don't tend to use these at all in my still photography because I shoot RAW rather than JPEG, but I do use them a lot for video. So for example, this video has been recorded in the Provia film simulation, for example, and you can see here, this is Provia, and then you've got the super saturated Velvia, you've got classic Chrome, which also always looks nice. You've got a much more kind of faded look with the Eterna Cinema. Now you've got the new look, new uh, simulation of Eterna Bleach Bypass, which gives you this really low saturation and high contrast look, and then things like Acros, and there are others, but these are my favorites and the ones that I use most often. Now, Fuji have come a long way with the video capacities of their cameras. When I first had the X-T1, it was a terrible video camera. You couldn't use it. The output was worse than the GoPro Hero 4 that I was using at the time. But the video quality on this camera is superb now. The options, the output quality, make this an incredibly capable video camera and something that I will use all the time for pretty much all of my video recording. So in terms of image quality, I've always been really happy with the Fuji X series. And since I switched from a full frame system, I can honestly say that I've never had any regrets. And I've always found that these cameras have been perfectly good enough for my work both professionally and personally, creatively and things like that. The images really are good. Now there's always the, the difference between not as good and good enough. There's always going to be a camera that can shoot better. So if you want the absolute best in image quality, you should be looking at something like the, the medium format series like the GFX cameras or something like a full frame system. That's going to give you a little bit better image quality, but do you really need that level of image quality? Now I've shot quite a number of times with the Fuji GFX 50 uh, and the images really are wonderful. The resolution is wonderful and I find that I can zoom in and there's loads and loads of detail there. But what I also find is that about a month down the line, when I'm put, putting the images together, if I'm having some kind of submission to a magazine or something like that, or, or to a client, is that I don't differentiate between images that I shot with a, with a medium format camera and few images that I shot with the X series cameras. I kind of stop seeing the difference. I don't think of them one as being better than the other because they're both good enough for my professional purposes. And I've never yet had a client prefer an image because it came from a higher resolution camera. So the fact is, is how good do you really need your images to be? We live in a world now where everyone makes excellent cameras. There aren't really any bad cameras. Everything is going to give you absolutely fantastic image quality. So when you get to that level, when everything that will give you images that are good enough for professional use, then other factors start to come into play. Now for me, the, what I prefer about the Fuji system is that it's really lightweight and it's incredibly intuitive and, and pleasant to use. And that to me is more important than a very negligible difference in resolution that I'm not gonna notice one month down the line and that my clients aren't gonna notice. But what I will notice is how much I enjoy using the camera and how light it is and how easy it is when I'm out hiking with it and trying to get to the kind of places where I like to shoot. And in that respect, the X-T4, like all of the X-Series cameras, is just wonderful to use. I find it just really tactile. It fits in the hand really well. It has a really nice size and weight. 
I love using the EVF and the LCD and getting a live feedback, a live preview of the images before I take them. I really enjoy using the dials, the tactile controls. It's incredibly usable. And I find I can carry this and the X-T3 along with a drone in my backpack and hike for two hours and really not feel that I'm complaining about the weight. It doesn't feel that it's hindering me or holding me back in any way. So for me, this is really a fantastic camera. But whether it's worth upgrading from the X-T3 to this camera, or if you're out coming from outside of the Fuji system and looking to buy the X-T3 or the X-T4, the decision that you make is really gonna depend on how useful image stabilization is to your shooting. Because if you're someone who shoots almost exclusively from a tripod and you don't shoot much video, then the only tangible difference that you're gonna notice with this camera is the better battery life and the slightly different screen. And if that's the case, then it might be worth saving a little bit of money and just going with the X-T3. However, if you're someone who does a lot of video shooting, particularly handheld and for things like vlogs, or if you do handheld shooting in the field, I find myself, I'm shooting more and more handheld images, uh, still photography images, then this camera really is excellent. The image stabilization is fantastic for vlogging. It's fantastic for panning shots. It's fantastic for doing things like B-roll really, really useful. Now I'm going to be traveling with both this and the X-T3 in my bag. And I know that for still photography, I'll use the cameras interchangeably, really basically using whichever one has the lens on it that I need for a particular shot, because the image quality is going to be excellent. But when it comes to making a video, I'm pretty much always going to go with the X-T4 because things like the screen, the image stabilization, make a huge amount of difference to, to video shooting. So going into the future, what this means for Fuji's line really isn't clear. This is the first flagship camera Fuji have made that doesn't feature a new sensor and a new image processor. Uh, in the past, the X-Pro line was always the, the line, was always the flagship line. It was always the first line that had the new sensor until we got to the third generation when the X-T3 came first and the X-Pro3 came at the end. Uh, we still have the X-H2 to come, which Fuji has said is definitely coming. So maybe that's going to be the flagship camera with the new sensor. And also what this means to the X-T30 and X-T40 also really isn't clear. It's, I don't know if Fuji can put the image stabilization in something like the X-T40 and keep that same small factor that makes it so appealing. But if it doesn't have the image stabilization, then the X-T40 is going to be an almost identical camera to the X-T30. But all that's just really idle and geeky speculation. What I can say about the X-T4 is that it is a perfectly rounded camera. It's excellent for my needs for landscape photography and for video making and it just feels like a really well-balanced camera. So I think that's pretty much everything. If there's anything that I've missed, if there's any questions that you have, just drop me a comment in the box below. And uh, I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been useful. And as ever, thanks for watching and take care.